All right, folks. Sorry for all that. Welcome. And Steve Johnson here. Welcome to another episode of the Hump Day Hanger Presentations brought to you by Supercup.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. Before I introduce tonight's guests, I've got a couple quick things I need to cover. It's less than a month to the first ever Arkansas event being held down here at Birds Adventure Center. A bunch of folks are going to be flying into this part of beautiful Northwest Arkansas. And so while they're not the towering peaks of Colorado, this is remote backcountry flying environment and you should plan accordingly. You may, may find some mist in the valleys in the mornings and the evenings. Uh, we have some wind from time to time and there are lots of trees. There's also a lot of super cool airstrips and a great resource called the Airfield Guide that lets you know which ones you can use and how to use them. Many of these hundred or so airstrips in the area are on private land, so make sure you check the permission status of these strips using the airfield guide before you land on them. You can even download an overlay of them into ForeFlight if you'd like to find them more easily. Many of them have noise abatement procedures as well. We want to keep these opportunities open for everyone, so please be a good steward of the area when you are down here enjoying all that Arkansas aviation has to offer. So when you're down here, uh, stop into KVBT, Victor Bravo Tango, which is the Bentonville Municipal Airport and say howdy. It's about 50 miles away from birds. There's lots of instructors here who teach backcountry operations on all of these trips. So it's a great place to come and get some information and not have a nice meal at the Louise Cafe or some great service from the FBO, which is located on the Northwest part of the field. I'll be around here all week. So if you come in, look me up. So let's talk a couple minutes about the event that's bringing everybody down here, Arkansas. It would really help the team that is working hard to make this an excellent event if you would register in advance if you're planning on attending. They need to know when you're coming and going for meal planning, how many porta potties they need, and most importantly, arrival and departure planning. So although we're tired of talking about it, it's important to note that they have a state of Arkansas approved COVID plan for the event. And there's plenty of room there for social distancing, even with lots of airplanes. So Birds is a really big place and a real treat if you've not been there before. Be sure to spend some time on the Arkansas website, arkansas.com, before you head out. There is a ton of information there that is being continually updated, including how to find out when the field will be notum to close to arrivals during the contest. There's even a Google Earth fly through showing you the best arrival procedure to the event. Think mini Oshkosh from your standpoint on being prepared. There's a hardworking and dedicated team of people working on delivering this event. Their goal is to have a fun and safe event, and it takes all of us to help them do that. I look forward to seeing you in Arkansas or in Bentonville on your way to and from. If you've got questions about Arkansas or Flying Oz and you're not getting an answer for it, don't hesitate to shoot me an email at steve at supercup.org and I will get you hooked up. We look forward to you coming here and we think you're really gonna like it. So for most people in aviation, the flying cowboys need no introduction, but I'm going to introduce them by reading the mission statement they sent me. The flying cowboys are a group of backcountry aviation enthusiasts striving to increase their skills while promoting general aviation through continual training and sharing their adventure and lessons learned through social media. As always, we're going to be monitoring both uh, the YouTube and Zoom chat streams for your questions for tonight's guests. So please take advantage of that as we go through the discussion this evening. Mark Patey, Kevin Quinn, and Jason Sneed, welcome to the program. All right, thanks for having us. Glad to be here. So um, tell us a little bit about who the Flying Cowboys are. Kevin, you want to take that one? You know, we, we are a group, a collective group of passionate aviators that uh, literally, I mean, we want to inspire aviation across the globe. And that really is our number one mission. We're here, you know, we, we put so much stuff out on this social media platform now that we have this available to us the last six, eight, 10 years. And we, we never really asked to become influencers, but I guess, you know, that's what you could call it. And and we don't take that responsibility lightly. And um, it's something that we're obviously proud of, but really the idea of inspiring pilots all over the planet has become our focus. And even as of late, we're, we're really trying to change that focus, I think, which we'll talk a little bit more about is the fact that there's tr a lot of training that goes into what you see. You know, we all grew up watching Dukes of Hazard, and gosh, I still haven't, you know, jumped over a train or ran from the law, so to speak, but 
you know, we, we train and we work hard to, to become proficient. And there's that old adage, you know, everybody's after that really good experience. And, you know, to get that good experience, you need to be proficient. You need to train. You need to be diligent about what you do with your mindset and all of the above. And just don't go do it because you saw it on the Internet. And, uh, you know, what, with what Jason and both Mark and Mike are doing out there in Utah with Steve Henry, uh, with what he's doing, two-time Oshkosh Lindy winner, Trent Palmer. I mean, Trent's become the biggest YouTube sensation on the planet as far as backcountry aviation goes. And, you know, we've got Scott Palmer and all of his exploits doing the dusting. So we all have a different attribute to aviation. And, and I don't take it lightly. It's something that is, is – uh, we're privileged to be part of that's for sure. I have ran from the law. <laughs> In all honesty, I have ran from the law. So, <laughs> do you want? Do we have time for that story? <laughs> no. Don't ask um, <laughs> yeah, I think you know the. I, for, I think everybody has a different perspective on on who we are and what we are and what we're about. I mean, you know, for me, it's just. Uh, Mark and I were flying together a bunch, and then we've got some friends over um, at the Tavaputs Ranch. Who, who I say friends, they're really our family. And Mark called me up one, one night and said, "Hey, you want to go do some cowboying?" And I said, "What does that What does that incur?" And he said, "Well, cowboying and airplanes." And I said, "Sure." So um, you know, we went, and and everybody at the Tavaputs Ranch, they just call us their fly, the the flying cowboys because everybody else is called the cowboys, and we're the flying cowboys. And so that was kind of my uh, introduction to it. And, um, and I think now, you know, this, I guess, to some degree, some spotlight's been put on us due to social media. And, um, and we just, we, I think we all feel like the more people we could get into backcountry aviation and the more pilots in general that we could, um, you know, get in the air, it's, it's just benefits to all of us. And I, I know for Mark and I both, that's the, one of the cool, or the coolest thing that ever happens to me is being at Oshkosh and having a, you know, 18 year old kid to a 20 year old kid telling me that he got his license because he watched my videos or watched the flying cowboy videos. And, um, I've had like an eight year old kid tell me, you know, I flew my super cub on the simulator everywhere in your videos. And, and I, you know, sometimes I question why I spend the time videoing and editing and doing all that work. And, and then that reminds me that's why is getting young people interested in aviation. And I think Steve, um, the best way I could I, I could maybe add to what they're saying is um, if you want to understand what the flying cowboys are, sometimes it's easier to define what you're not. Um, and like Jason said, you know, we started out um, the, the Utah group of flying cowboys started out because our planes smell like feed for the cattle. And we run the bedding down to the cowboys down on the Green River where you can't get trucks and Jeeps during the cattle run. And we find the missing animals, you know, after, uh, after they've been out to pasture for a season. And so for us, you know, airplanes was a tool for running cattle, running feed, running supplies to the cowboys. And uh, so like he says, we became the flying cowboys. But um, sadly, uh, cowboys has two definitions if you look it up. And one is, is more uh, reckless attitude and and um, though we like to play hard in our airplanes, the goal is, like Kevin said, we play hard in our airplanes to advance a skill set. Um, and so what if I said, what, what's the flying cowboys or who are the flying cowboys? Well, first and foremost, we're really actually flying cowboys and not flying outlaws. Um, we're not trying to go out and break laws, break rules. We want to do it right. We want to do it safe. But because what we do isn't normal, um, some people can take the cowboy label and take it away from the fact that our planes smell like feed and, and mud and, and just the cowboy stench. Um, and they think it's, it's an attitude towards reckless behavior. And that's not it. It's, it's actually the opposite. And one thing we've thought a lot about because people kind of latch onto the cowboy in the wrong way is maybe shifting how we do our videos because we do these fun videos. We do some, some really, I would say advanced flying with our aircraft, but what we haven't done a good job with is showing all the practice that goes behind it. If you just, I, I used the example in a conversation the other day, uh, a friend of ours that does air shows, and when he was out in one of his airplanes, he was flying upside down down a canyon, you know, and someone just, you know, came unglued that 
that guy was only 500 feet off the ground upside down. What, what kind of reckless cowboy idiot is that? He should lose his license. It's like, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. You got to put it in perspective. This guy at the air show flies upside down and cuts a ribbon at 10 feet. And he cuts that ribbon every time. He never misses 10 feet off the ground inverted. And so the upside down cruising around the canyon not only isn't risky, it's almost, I'm just here because I was tired of flying upright, but the skill set was there, the practice is there. And so I think um, the flying cowboys and trying to make sure people don't think we're flying outlaws, we are gonna make a new focused effort to say, yeah, look, when we're landing on one tire on a, on a, a airport or a landing strip, we call right turn. You have to land on one tire. It's 9,000 feet, it's about 12,000 feet density altitude. You got about 250 feet to get stopped and you land in a right turn on your right tire and you roll out uphill on your right tire and you set the main down, then you back down the hill and then you go up and you whip it and you come back down. If you just put that video out there, someone's gonna go try that. But before you were doing right turn landings, you were landing on one tire on a wide open lake bed and you did it a hundred times or a thousand times and then your left tire and then you're doing short field spot landings and then you're combining it together and you're doing a whole lot of high altitude um, short runway landings and now you're doing spot landing high altitude on a right tire and it um, it it's safe and can be safe much like you know with the right practice somebody can go to an air show and do some pretty amazing things in an airplane right in front of a crowd full of people that if it goes wrong a whole bunch of people die but that doesn't mean it's reckless it meant there was a lot of practice and so to Kevin's statement, I'll kind of end it here. I tend to be long-winded. so. But <laughs> um, our goal is to get people to fly more, to become proficient. I think it's, it's, it's sickening and sad to me that when people go get their license, they meet the minimum requirement. This is the FAA's word, the minimum requirement to get just a private pilot's license, which includes spot landings, includes engine out landings, includes stall demonstrations, it includes steep turns. And then they get their license and they never stall their airplane again. They don't do simulated engine outs anymore. They're not doing a spot landing every time they come in. And that's where it gets really, really dangerous. And so we're kind of the extreme other end of that where someone would say, hey, do you really have to pull the engine every time you come into the pattern? It's like, no, but why not? Is, it, is there such a thing as too much practice? In a, in a nutshell, we're, we're passionate aviators that are literally trying to make good pilots better. I'm just a pilot and we've become this, this whatever influencer or whatever adjective you want to put on it, but I'm just a pilot. I've been flying since I was a kid, but I fly every single day. I live and breathe flying. I grew up in a house full of, of a household of, of pilots with my dad and family and grandfathers and I try to fly every single day. And if I can post a picture every single day on these social media platforms, maybe it's going to inspire somebody to go out and do the same thing. And, and now you'll see that we're really changing course with, you know, I, I'll be the first to say people will always come and say, oh, you're that, oh, didn't you water ski around Lake Tahoe? Well, yeah, and I hang my head. And to be perfectly honest, it's, it's, yeah, we did that, but it's not something that I'm really proud of, to be honest with you. And it's something that, I downplay and now with what we're doing at Reno and Stoll Drag, we have this presence and the FAA is looking at us like, hey, you guys are sort of this face of aviation and there's a responsibility to go with that. And they're okay with this water ski thing, but if I see a guy water skiing out in the middle of a lake, especially with a passenger on board, I'll send him a message. I mean, I don't condone that. And, and maybe I'm at fault for putting that out there 10 years ago when we were doing that, but. The focus for me in particular, like we're all saying, is really trying to educate folks on the safety aspect of what it is that we're doing. And really, proficiency provides a great experience. And if you're not proficient, you're probably going to get that experience in the backcountry that you're not looking for. And so if we can inspire folks to be safe and at least get them talking, I'm doing my job. I think, Very good. I think for... I think for me, and I think Mark's the same way, and I think it's kind of how we have this thing in common, is I don't care if it was like my first, I don't even remember what those things were called. I think big wheels, you know, it had the two small tires in the back. It was a tricycle. And I was like six years old and I, I wanted to 
figure out what are the limits of that big wheel and I want to be able to do everything I can do on it and be able to do a 360 and so I just have always felt like whether it's a motorcycle or a big wheel or whatever I always want to just know the limits of that um of that tool of that machine and then I always I want to try to make my skill set be able to to make that machine to get to the limit of that machine and I don't know what that really is, but it's just been a real big desire that I've always had, no matter what I'm approaching, whether it's racing sailboats or flying airplanes or, or whatever. And I think Mark has that same um, thing. And, and I, and I think it's a scary thing that there's pilots out there that they don't know the limit of their aircraft. And to me, that's extremely scary because if you don't know where the limit is, then how do you know how close you are to it if you if you don't know where it is? You make a great point, Jay, because, I mean, Steve, you know, being a CFI, every time I give a BFR, you ask someone, when's the last time you did some slow flight or stalled your aircraft? Well, since my last BFR, that is not acceptable. And so, you know, and I don't mean to interrupt you, Jay, but now these guys, given the state of the world that we have, they're loading their aircraft up. They're not proficient. They're going into the backcountry. And we're not being able to hit our landing because we don't have good power and energy management skills. All of a sudden, we decide we want to go around and we can't. We end up in the trees and there's life altering experiences that could be prevented. And so at any rate, my apologies, Jay, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no problem. I'm, that's all I'm really saying is that, you know, and I, I don't I'm not saying that I expect or want, uh, you know, every pilot to go out there and and push the limit of their airplane and of their skill set at all times. I mean, that's not the right answer either. But, you know, if you've been flying for 25 years and your answer to the, to these kind of questions is, well, my instructor taught me this. I mean, the truth of the matter is if you've been, if you've been, if you've been flying for 20 years and you're still doing what your instructor taught you, you haven't progressed. And, and I just feel like there's a lot of progression that pilots should, should make after their training and, and, I don't really see it. You know, I see the guy come in on a, in a Sirius and he doesn't care where his first touchdown point is because the runway is 6,000 feet. And, and I just, I just step back and go, man, I, I just wish that they would push themselves a little harder and say, I'm going to try to land, you know, at the thousand foot marker, or I'm going to try to land here. And, and I just, um, I don't know. I just wish I saw more progression of, of current pilots and their skill set. So, so how do you get, so talking about that a little bit and, and uh, you know, uh, actually there's, there's some things I've taught my students 20 years ago that, that I hope they still remember, <laughs> but, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, the, uh, so how do we get from that, you know, one, to, to where most people should be? So one of the things I try to do for myself and for people is, if, is when I land, every time I land, no matter where it is, I tell myself where I'm going to put the airplane. I don't yeah. care if it's then, a thousand foot runway. I don't care if it's halfway down the runway. It doesn't mean that and I'm then the, and then, Yeah, just try to meet that. Is, uh oh. Jason, that's Jason. a good look. <laughs> I <laughs> lost the video. I lost everything. There he's back. <laughs> but just but honest, the problem is is that the other thing is is people will be like, okay, I'm gonna pick where I want to land. But the second part of that equation is you have to honestly analyze how you really right. did. And, um, you know, Mark and I, sometimes we haven't been doing it recently because we've trying to been trying to build airplanes. But, you know, one of the things we were doing is on spot landings is um, I would come in and, and land, hit a line with cones on it. And I would have to tell Mark, who's standing on the ground with a handheld, I would have to tell him how much I landed. You know, did I land on the line? Did I land three feet past it? Did I land three feet before it? But I had to tell him then he had to he has to tell me how I did. And um, so, you know, if you're going to try to advance your skill set you have to be honest with yourself and and I, and in, what i think really happens is a lot of people they just rather not analyze themselves so they just don't do it that, that you know in their mind they can just go yeah i can land where i want but until you really get out there and do it or have your buddy standing there with a walk you know a handheld telling you how you did you know you're just kind of I like telling people all the time, hit the thousand foot markers, there's no sense dragging it in and hitting the threshold on a big runway where most people live. Build yourself a buffer, work on a drag it in approach, but the steep angle approach to allow yourself to hit those thousand foot markers that are 150 feet long, you can hit within that first 10 feet repetitively. That's a great practice in these big patterns. If I'm a student or with a student and he's not going to make it back to the runway and 
sometimes I feel like I'm the bad guy on the radio, but I, I'll ask someone. I mean, most recently I'm getting checked out in this Stearman and we're literally doing three to four landings to one of this massive pattern, these 141. <laughs> and I'll get on the radio respectfully and then maybe even have a conversation afterwards. But a lot of these CFIs with three, 400 hours are doing a disservice to their students because you pull the power, I'll say verbatim, hey, if you lose that engine, you're going to make it to the runway? I know they're not going to. And, you know, the, the CFI will get on and say, oh, well, I have a student on board. And no disrespect, sir, but you're giving that student a disservice because we practice what we preach and we work on muscle memory. And now you're flying over the empty fields or empty, or I should say the tall trees in the mountains. And you got one little field you're going to make. Are you going to make that? Because... Maybe not. Maybe you have poor power and energy management skills and you don't understand the concept of a spot landing. And so in your confines of your own airport where it's comfortable practicing this over and over and over, you can't get, you're never going to be too good. And what are the odds of having an engine out in the pattern? Well, probably, probably, you know, minimal. However, I live by the motto. It's not a matter of if, but when, and like Jason was saying, all of us, and I think all of those that are watching, you know, we all have egos and we're all passionate people and passionate about what we're doing. And so be passionate about the training that you put into it so that if in the event it does happen to you, you're prepared for it. And that's, that's the bottom line. Very good. Hey, Mark, I got to interrupt just for a second. I accidentally made you the host of this event. So, oh, wow. So you are the man that's totally in charge. So if you leave, everybody else is going to leave. Okay. <laughs> actually, well, I just want to let you know this meeting's ending soon. So. <laughs> if no you can, pressure, uh, actually, out. if you can tap your screen, I don't know if you're on an iPad, right. you can actually go to the, if you can go to the list of participants, you can reassign the host to me, which would be helpful if you don't mind. Or I think you can just click my name and reassign me as the host. But don't, don't worry okay. about it. Don't get caught up in it if it's not easy. That's that's done. Oh, what thank you, you sir. Appreciate easy. that. You know what? How old do you think I am, Steve? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you're now you're now the uh, admin. You're in okay. charge. That's why that's why he was late to the meeting because he hacked his way into being the admin. <laughs> that's what it is. Okay, so you talked a little bit. You guys talked a little bit about um, uh, you know. Uh, you talked a little bit about sort of some of the negative stuff, right? And, and things that uh, some, of, some of the kind of the, the negative things people are, are saying about you all. And, and uh, how, do you, how do you deal, how do you work with that? How, how do you, uh, um, what do you say to the people that say, oh, there are a bunch of rich guys that are just out flying around airplanes and don't have, they have more money than sense. What do, you, what do you say to that, to those kinds of things? I know that's a tough question, but. Well, I don't but have I a lot of money out. and I don't have a lot of sense, but <laughs> I, my response is that, you know, I'm 51 years old now and I've been fortunate. I've worked very hard. I had a paper route when I was 12 years old. I've worked my entire life. And, um, you know, in order to become something that you want to be, you have to immerse yourself in it 100%. You can't go half in. And depending on the, on the time of year, I'm either a big wave surfer, I'm a skier, or well, I'm a pilot year round, but it's kind of unique where this surf life doesn't know my ski and flying life, my flying life doesn't know my ski and surf life, but I immerse myself in those and I try to become educated and proficient as I possibly can and live that role 24 seven and, and things happen. You know, Obviously I'd be the first to admit I've become very lucky with a lot of things that I've done, but I've, I've lived the life of, I don't ever want to work for the man, no matter what, if I have to go and stand on a street corner with a spray bottle and a squeegee, I'll wash windows and I'll make my living that way. But I'm not a rich guy. I'm, I've, I've done well for myself through hard work, but you know, if those people think that we're just a bunch of rich cats out there, spoiled brats doing their thing, well, that's just what it is. It's not factual and you got to move on. I, I don't know that um, I don't know that that ever bothers me. Um, the The reality is there's there there is for whatever reason people that don't like people that see you guys. Sorry, saying goodbye to my kids. Um, <laughs> that uh, have an issue with people that have more than them, and and I've just learned that you can't let that bother you. In fact, I found more often than not, the more successful somebody is in their personal and financial life, um, they're it's because of their drive, dedication, commitment, and work ethic. And that usually rolls over into aviation. So 
although there are those with money that just buy an expensive airplane and don't put the time into it, I've seen a lot of people with a lot of money that buy expensive airplanes and then they attack it with a passion. They attack it with a drive and a commitment like they did their business that made them their money or they attack it with a, with a, a real desire to learn. And I, I honestly, I feel bad for those who carry that animosity to somebody who's had success. You'd think hopefully they would look at someone and go, wonder what I could learn from that individual. But, I, but there is something out there. There's a bias. I don't know what it is. There's particular serious drivers. There's a serious behind me here. Um, <laughs> but I, I landed at uh, Centennial Airport once and my wife, Cirrus, and I came walking in and two pilots are walking out to their, their uh, Bonanza, which I got nothing. This Bonanza has nothing to do with the story, but somehow <laughs> Cirrus does for people. And one of the guys intending for me to hear and in a very negative way goes "Uh oh get back here comes a serious pilot he's gonna kill all of us and i just looked at him and and i said what does that mean exactly well you know the stereotype fits rich guys with a serious can't fly airplanes and i said so if i landed in my premier jet would you treat me different and he just looks at me goes you fly a premier jet i said yeah i got a premier jet i can fly that but since i'm in a serious i automatically don't know what i'm doing well, you know, real pilots fly tail draggers. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> last year I won the Stoll Championship World <laughs> Finals drag race in a carbon cub without nitrous or turbo. And they're like, oh, sorry, man, sorry. Well, you're the exception. I'm like, no, I'm actually not. There's a lot of good pilots out there. Why why assume the worst in people? I, I don't know. I, I like to be happy. And I found I'm happiest when I assume the best in every person I meet. You just meet someone. Don't assume they're bad. Don't assume they're a jerk. Assume they're good people. Like online chats and text messages. When someone writes something online, you can often read it. And if you read it like in an all caps way, it, they're being super rude, sarcastic, and they're being jerks. And if you read it without all caps, maybe it's not. And I've just learned just read it with a smile on your face. Assume they had a smile on your face and you'll be happier for it. Life's, life's too short to worry about the haters. And the reality is I think most haters really aren't. They're not, there's not, I just assume the best. So that's how I handle it. Just assume that, the best in people. That is excellent. That is an excellent response. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to waste any more time on it, but I just think, you know, <laughs> jealousy is like the root of all evil. And I think that, a lot of it is just, you know, somebody that's that's jealous. And I just think that's a bad way to be about anything. I mean, if you're jealous because your neighbor has a nicer car than you, then I don't know, you should reassess the way you see the world, I guess. <laughs> hey, I've got some uh, got some questions coming in here. You guys have some more things you want to say or you want to you want to answer a few questions? Uh, we could just mix it up. You can give us a question. Uh, hey, well, I'm, I'll ask you a couple while we're in here. So, um, uh, so John Young, who's actually one of the guys who's putting on Arkansas, asked the question uh, that this type of flying has brought a renewed interest in aviation. What's the best advice you can give to someone who wants to get started in backcountry? Find somebody that's already doing it and has been doing it and, yeah. uh, and connect to the hip with them and learn from them. And if you're brand new into it, you know, CFI and but but really the the best thing I have people call me all the time should I get this airplane should I buy that airplane and I started saying get the airplane that your buddy has because um I just think there's so much to learn from if you can find that guy that that has been doing it and and knows the ropes and just you just have to ease into it um you know you, you can't I mean Mark and I were talking about this the other day and we kind of mentioned it in this video is um you know, we need to do a better job at, I mean, it's, it's hard because I don't want to make a video that sits there and says, I've been doing this for so long and I've done this and that and blah, 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 because I kind of sound like I'm, to me, I sound like I'm being boastful, but um, you know, I didn't just build a carbon cub and go land at 12,000 feet in a right turn. Like it didn't happen. Um, you know, at a, at a hundred hours, I thought, man, I really know this airplane. I got it figured out. And then at 150 hours, I said, wow, I've learned some more things. And then at 500 hours, I said, I really got this thing figured out. But then at 800 hours, I had to, all these little minute things I figured out too. So I think the, the key is, is to really step in slow and just 
be a sponge and absorb information from people that have been doing it would be my, my recommendation. And I, I saw that question, Steve, and I've been trying to respond to him, but my response really, the best thing that, that you can do is go practice slow flight, stall your aircraft, understand the characteristics of your aircraft in different configurations for all aviation, for all pilots in any type of aircraft. And that will then correlate to where you want to go into the backcountry. Obviously, there's some, some things that are unique to the backcountry itself and off airport environment, but practice, practice, practice. And once you get into the backcountry, you'll deal with, you know, winds and weather and environment, density, altitude, things of that nature. But you can't practice and understand the characteristics of your aircraft enough. I, I think there's uh, one more thing. And, and I think pretty important is consider the source of your information. If you're learning to fly and you're getting started in aviation, I got to tell you, for every one good thing said online, there's eight people stating things that are simply inaccurate. I, I stay away from it. I don't want to get into it, but you know, I've seen things people say, you know, we do water assisted landings and beach landings up a river and we practice for it. And, and, um, and you can say it's high risk or not. It's certainly higher risk than landing on a 12,000 foot runway. That's 200 feet wide. There's no question. But then you get people that get online and say, make sure your brakes are locked. And someone else says, make sure your brakes aren't locked. And, make sure this, make sure that. And I'm like, these people have really, really strong opinions. And, and we've gone out and we did videos. We decided not to post them, but we're not did videos landing with our brakes on, landing with our brakes off, you know, water assisted landing with a skid into the beach, water assisted landing with reels rolling into a beach, you know, and played with it all these different speeds. And, and I thought, man, there's such good information here, but sadly the people that have the strongest opinion online usually are wrong. The ones that are so determined that they're 100% right might be the one you don't want to listen to. So as you're gathering information, consider the source. Um, if it's just somebody that's typing in all caps with explanation points at the end, I almost go, it might not be the source. Um, go to people that are actually doing stuff and ask them. And that goes with anything, what airplane to buy, what, what when to change my oil change on my on my Rotax engine. Well, ask a guy that's flying a Rotax. Don't ask a guy that's only flown Lycoming. You know, just consider the source on every fact you get and um, it'll go a long ways. That's the Don't ask on... about slow flight in the yeah. back country to a guy that's got 5,000 hours of Cirrus and 10 hours in his Cub. You might want to find someone with 5,000 hours in a Cub and 10 hours in a Cirrus, if that's the question. Well, the guy giving you advice on the internet might not even have a pilot's license. But it's funny you guys say that because just recently I made a post about training. I got a steerman. And so I'm diving myself into this quest for knowledge to become proficient. And I got eaten alive for doing tailwind or tailwind landings and left quartering and right quartering tailwind landings. And people who would do that? Why on earth would you do that? Well, every time you go to an airport, you never know what's going to be presenting itself as far as wind goes. And so, well, there, there's a technique that I learned from a gentleman that has about 15,000 hours in a steerman. Hey, don't go practice this at home, but this is a great technique as we land with 18, 20 knots on our tail, we bring in a little power to diminish that tailwind, put airflow over the tail feathers so that we have rudder authority and we stop in 300 feet rather than going through that downwind, getting pushed down the runway 2,000 feet, you go through that area where there's no control over the rudder whatsoever. Well, again, I want to be knowledgeable on all those aspects of it. So why would you not train it? If you're not comfortable with that, get somebody to do it with you and you got to pick your battles. I'm not going to go out tomorrow because I learned it and go find a 20 knot tailwind and go practice. But if I got a five knot tailwind, I'm going to go land in that five knot tailwind and I'm going to practice this proficiency so that at least I'm comfortable with it when that situation arises. And you get all these guys that, you know, they're the blue card pilot. They pull the blue card out. If it doesn't match the sky, they're not going to fly. They lick their finger. Oh, it's windy. Well, I'm that way right now in my steerman. Darren, it's windy. It's blowing two miles an hour across the runway. Maybe I'm going to hang out for a little bit and let the wind calm, but I want to be the guy that flies in the wind so that when I do get somewhere, I understand it and I've experienced it rather than the fellow that's sitting in the copy shop making fun of the pilot that's out there doing it, gaining that experience. Pick your battles, 
choose them wisely and become proficient at the task at hand. You want to be the best that you can be. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people try to circumvent, they're try, they try to circumvent that process of, of uh, that, that thing of just, uh, and they want to just go right from zero to 60. So like you buy a Stearman and you want to go suddenly be really proficient at it. And it just doesn't happen that way. And I think that when one of the things that happens with, with when people do really cool stuff on videos and post them on the internet is that nobody sees that process, right? right? It's not a cool thing to post. It's like, okay, well, here we are day 27 of trying a four knot crosswind in a steerman. Okay. We're going to try again. You know, you know, nobody makes a video that's like that. Right. So that's part of the thing. So, so everybody sort of looks at this and it doesn't matter what sport, you know, it's the, whether it's the Red Bull mountain biking guy or the snowboarder or whatever, you just, you, you think, man, this guy put a snowboard on this morning after never doing it before. And now he's zipping down this hill after jumping out of a helicopter or whatever. Right. So, so I think that's really important that people remember. And that just goes right along with all the proficiency stuff that you were saying earlier about doing it over and over and over again. So cool stuff. So when will you be proficient in this German, Kevin? Do you know? Hey, I got almost uh, 400 landings in 30 hours and I've been given rides and things are exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's opened up a whole new uh, department of aviation, to believe it or not. I, the folks that, that are flying the Stearman by the most part, you know, are, are 70 plus years old. I'm finding some younger, but I want to be a sponge in their pocket. I want to, you know, my dad used to tell me, boy, you can learn more from somebody sitting around a coffee table than you can flying with them. And I want to immerse myself with, with that group of folks and be educated because then that's going to come back and relate to, to everything else. You know, I fly, I fly my cub in my 180 and we land at mountains and mountaintops. And that's my, that's my passion. I love being, you know, for lack of a better word, a mountain pilot landing nine, 10,000 feet with density altitude through the roof. I get off on that kind of thing and, and finding out new things similar to my ski life. I'm looking for, when we get into a helicopter, I'm looking for a new line that I can go ski and, and paint my canvas, you know, so to speak, put my tracks on it. But this whole uh, idea of, the Stearman and the nostalgia and the history that goes with it. I'm blown away and I'm, I'm just, I'm humbled by it. And I feel very privileged to be able to fly one. And it's just an awesome, awesome form of aviation that I've never really been experienced to. And so I'm so new at it. I'm a blow up the internet daily with photos. I love it. <laughs> hey, do you guys want to switch gears a little bit? I, I, Cause we, we kind of skipped over some things. We were, when we, when we talked the other day, briefly, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, sort of the flying cowboys as a group and how people get in and out of it and some of those kinds of things. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of that kind of stuff? I could, I could talk about that one a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the flying cowboys is a pretty small group. And, you know, there's, there's people that we'd say are friends of the flying cowboys. And um, when at one point we had decided that we didn't want a whole bunch of people to be flying cowboys because they didn't understand what it meant, so we set a criteria, you know, to be a flying cowboy, you had to have a minimum of 5,000 total flight hours, you had to have at least 1,000 hours of tailwheel time, you had to have aerobatic instruction, and had completed all those phases, um, and then we even thought maybe we should have instrument rating as a requirement for to be a flying cowboy, we started to try to say, how can we make it really hard, and then you started realizing that there were people that could meet those requirements that kind of wanted to join our, our what is really a small group that um, you didn't want to have joined. So I'll give you two, two examples that I think are important and can be applied to every pilot um, in flying. And one was somebody that wanted to say, I say uh, be officially a flying cowboy. And uh, Jason said, well, I'll go fly with him and see if he has the right attitude and skill set. And the skill set was absolutely there but he was uh, an outlaw. He was a flying outlaw, not a flying cowboy. He wasn't so concerned about being proficient and being a cowboy. You know, the cowboy's the guy that will pull over, pull you out of your truck, out of the side of the, the ditch on the side of the road in the winter and not accept the $20 bill. That's a cowboy, right? The outlaw is the guy that is out there trying to show off in his airplane and doesn't have the skill set to be doing what he's doing. And Jason went with the guy and but it's also done. He says, hey, can I be a flying cowboy? He's like, no, I don't think so. And, and what do you mean? What, why not? He says, well, your attitude, your comments about, you know, wanting to buzz this guy or do this. And, and um, it didn't let him in. And then we had uh, 
really the most painful experience we've had in the Flying Cowboys was a couple of years ago. And I had to talk to this pilot and say, can I tell this story? And, and um, two years ago, we had one of the Flying Cowboys uh, did something that we felt was reckless. You know, he called on, on the radio and says, hey, I'm going to go do this. And we're like, no, don't do that. That's, that's not only reckless, it's also illegal. And he went and did it. And so we decided we got to have an intervention. And um, was, you could say no harm, no foul, except that um, when we went and sat down and had a meeting, we said, look, you, we can't have that. You can't say be a flying cowboy. You can't break the law. You can't, you know, he, he buzzed a boat is what he did. He got within 500 feet of a boat intentionally. And the people on the boat, he's like, oh, they thought it was great. They're waving, they're smiling, they're laughing, they're giving thumbs up. And we said, don't care. It's against the law, you, you can't do that. And what we expected was for this pilot to go, guys, you're right, I'm sorry, I'll change my attitude, I'll stop, um, thanks for setting me down. And he didn't, he, he got really angry. The meeting got ugly for a moment there. I thought poor Jason Sneed and this cowboy were gonna be at fists. And um, in the end, uh, what was supposed to be an intervention for his safety, um, was a loss of a friendship. I mean, he walked out and didn't want to talk to us, didn't want to be a part of the group. And of course, we had to tell him, you're out of the group. And uh, for months, we never talked to him. And uh, I mean, I, I lost sleep over it. I mean, this is a dear friend that we flew with all the time. And then after a while, we'd see him around the airport. We'd say, how you doing, bud? And, oh, I'm good. How you doing? And two years goes by the friendship's healing at the airport, but we never flew with him. We wouldn't invite him to go flying. He couldn't come with us because we hadn't seen any reason to think something had changed. And just last week, Jason and I were in working on ambush and deception. Those are our six cylinder carbon cubs. And he walks in, he says, guys, I want to talk to you. And we said, okay, how are you doing? He says, good. And he says, I wanted to thank you. And we said, what for? He says, it's taken me two years to realize you guys were right. And I've been flying reckless. And I, I was deciding that if I didn't like the law the FAA made, that mean I didn't need to keep it. And I was wrong. The law is the law. And you guys were watching out for me. And my reaction was inappropriate. And he you, literally used the words. He says, for about six months, I've been doing some serious soul searching. And I can't believe how hard it must have been for you guys to have an intervention with me. That had to have been hard. And I just wanted to thank you and let you know I love you and I appreciate you, and I'm flying differently, and I'm taking it seriously, and I'm looking at life different, and I just appreciate your friendship. I mean, that was like a hug and tears kind of a moment, but it was two years we lost a friend. Two years because we had an intervention about going 300 feet from a boat instead of staying 500, you know, and some might say, Mark, you guys are, that's way too harsh. You shouldn't put a friend through that, but I lost my brother-in-law in a plane crash. Um, we lost four pilots here in Utah two weeks ago because they stalled in a Cessna and spun in. And I'd say, is that a proficiency thing or was that a bad judgment to have four people in a 172? I don't know, but I'm tired of losing people. And if I have to lose a friend, but I don't have to bury him, I'll take that every single time. And those are tough, tough things. And I think that's kind of part of the deal of being a, a cowboy, not a outlaw, right? A, a cowboy will go to his friend and say, buddy, you got to put your, pull your act together. You got to, you got to fly straight. You got to do what's right. You got to obey the law. You got to take care of your family. You got to serve the loved ones around you. You, you can't do this, whatever it is, drugs, drinking, stepping out on your wife. You got to be able to step up and say, buddy, I'm your brother. And it's time to stop. It's time to knock it off. And and hopefully it doesn't take two years for those wounds to heal. But um, for me, I think that was one of the greatest things that just last week, Jason, I mean, for you, I mean, that was, I, it was just amazing to see him come in with that attitude. Yeah. But I just think, I think, and we were talking about this in the last meeting, but um, you know, the pi pilots are a small group. And uh, we should all be looking out for each other. And, and even if they're not in your flying group or your group of friends that you fly with, I mean, you know, and I've seen some stuff and I go back and forth on whether I should say something or not. I've been at, you know, I spend a lot of time at Johnson Creek normally and, and I've seen some really bad stuff there. And 
man, so bad. You know, there's been certain times I just want to go talk to that, that pilot, but you know, I'm going, am I, should I, should I, or should I not? But I just, I really think that um, we should all, if we see something dangerous, or even if we just see that we could help somebody out, we really, really should um, look after and, and help other pilots. And if that means walking up and as sugar-coated as you can possibly say it and start a conversation and, and you know, it's really hard to do, but to have to watch somebody come into Johnson Creek and land midfield and bounce all the way to the rocks at the White House, I mean... That, that guy, somebody should talk to him, you know, and um, it's not fun to do it, but I think we sh should all take, we all should. You make a, you make a good point, Jason, because we were just literally with Richard McSpadden, AO, AOPA Safety Institute recently at Smiley Creek. And we had all of the, the heads of all the, the backcountry aviation departments. And, you know, we're all on the same page and trying to inspire folks. And, and you know, it's, it's not the monkey see monkey do thing. It's, it's what you're comfortable with, get out, train, become proficient, et cetera. But how do you have that conversation with pilots? Because it, as pilots, we have egos, we all have egos and everybody considers themselves a good pilot. And I've been on this mission that, you know, I, I always say, I'm just a pilot. I fly every day. And, I take it very seriously, but I want to make good pilots better. But how do you approach someone with the idea of that these guys have egos, you know? And, and it's it's that conversation that you have with, I, this social media thing is horrible and what it does now with interaction of the human beings. You can't get emotion. You can't look at somebody in the eyes and tell what they're really thinking. You just get this one liner and it can be either a negative context or a positive context and there, there's no emotion in it. And so to be able to, you know, and I'm not an advocate of like coming across the radio and, and harshing on someone, but maybe there's a way to, to professionally or politely have a discussion after the fact when they're walking around the airport and, hey, what were you thinking about this? I'd love to pick your brain and maybe you could learn something from them. But I'm trying to figure out, you know, the, the positive or professional, I'm not really sure the adjective on how you approach someone with that because Pilots have egos. You don't want to come across this flying cowboy, you know. <laughs> the, you know, the, hard, the hardest thing, though, this is a double-edged sword. And I don't know the solution. I, I'm glad we're having a discussion with, with this group because the, there are times where you need to sit down and talk to people about their flying. To, like in this, in this scenario, with this former flying cowboy who will probably be a flying cowboy again officially, um, where we knew him, we knew his skill set, we knew his flight hours, but the law is the law and there's a cut and dry. Um, but there's also on one side, it's like, you know, somebody, you know where their skill set is, you know, when maybe they're pushing a little too far and you need to have an intervention. But then there's the people you don't know where you might be actually the guy that's being a little bit presumptive to assume that the guy flying inverted at 500 feet, you might be assuming too much to say that's reckless when the guy actually can do it at five feet over and over safely and cut a ribbon right so you you can't like you look at somebody do something you're going to go i got to have an intervention because they're going to kill themselves it's like wait a second they might actually have twenty thousand hours doing exactly that thing and they got there safely but they might also be the guy with 200 hours that's trying to hit a 200 foot strip at eight thousand feet and i i I don't know the answer, guys, because you, you don't want to be the guy calling someone out who doesn't deserve it, who's just trying to advance their skill set. You don't want to be the guy that doesn't bring it up. And I don't know the balance. I, I'm not old enough to have the wisdom to know when you've crossed the line and accusing somebody of being stupid when they're not and when you're actually, you know, stepping up and telling someone to be safe. I, I don't know the answer. So I, I guess all should... we can do is take care of our own, you know, we can all take care of the people around us because the people around us are the ones we know their skill set and we might know better whether they're just advancing a skill set or if they're actually taking risks that their flight hours and logbook hasn't uh, got the experience yet to be doing. The problem is, is people tend to judge other pilots viewed through their own skill set. That's that's the problem. I mean, um, just be, you know, I think cutting a ribbon inverted 10 off, 10 feet off the ground, I think it's dangerous. I definitely think there's risk involved and I can't do it. But that guy that does it every day, 
that started at, at 50 feet and came down and he's been doing it his whole life. I totally understand that he has that skill set. And so I think it's smart to, instead of just judging uh, other pilots based on your skill set, you have to understand that their skill set is different than yours. And um, I don't know, I've, Mark and I have had a lot of that where people might be upset that we're doing something that is complete commonplace to us. We do it all the time and it's not a, we don't feel like we're reckless. We just feel like we do it all the time and we're proficient at it. But just because that person judging us doesn't have that skill set, they, they, they shouldn't call us dangerous. At least that's the way I see it. Sometimes oh. it's understanding too, you know, they don't understand why you feel the need to do that. You know, when there's a perfectly good runway right over here, you know, so. <laughs> right. Right, there's a perfectly good groomed ski resort, but Kevin's not gonna be happy unless he gets to paint his own canvas. And, and luckily in America, we get to be individuals. We get to decide whether we're comfortable driving a car or a motorcycle, or a motorcycle in busy traffic or only on Sundays up the canyon. Um, and we have to allow people that freedom to determine whether they want to jump out of an airplane with a squirrel suit on, or if they want to watch TV and not go outside. It's, it's not our place to, to determine who is allowed to have what risk level in life, right? That's, it's a little un-American. I mean, I'm, if I'm going to put on my red, white, and blue flag and say, America, it's, it's let people be people, but, um, Let's keep the laws the law, whether we agree or disagree, obey the stinking law, you know, especially with the FAA and aviation, because those laws, like they say, were written in blood. They're there for a reason. And um, aviation, aviation will straight up kill you. Someone would say, man, why do you guys land on those tops of those mountains? It's like, because it's beautiful and it's fun and we enjoy it because we can, you know, but um, someone else is, you know, they're, for them, they're like flying an instrument approach and think that that's perfectly safe. And I do too, but, but an instrument approach will straight up kill you way faster than landing on a backcountry airstrip will if you do it wrong. If you fly an instrument approach without the skill set and training, you are going to die. But you can fly an instrument approach all day, every day, perfectly safely and live if you have that skill set. Some people will never get an instrument rating and don't want the skill set to fly blind down to 200 feet. And some people will do it every day for a living with 200 people behind them legally and safely. So it all comes down to where's your skill set? Did you earn it and, and now doing it safely because you worked up to it? Or did you do what our biggest fear is kind of as the flying cowboys as a whole? Is there somebody that watched the video, didn't realize that that super cool video was weeks or months of practicing and 10,000 flight hours of experience that got to the right day and the right conditions and the right wind and the right temperature and the right just feeling good that day and and you did it they they just watch a video and go that looked easy I'll go do it and then that's that's as that's as dangerous as saying I think I could fly an instrument approach jumping in an airplane that has the equipment and flying into the soup and, and without the rating or training, it's just as deadly. And I wish people, I wish there was a way, and this video sure helps us, Steve. I'm glad you brought us on that we can say, look, everything in aviation, everything in aviation will kill you if you screw it up. So get there carefully, get there safely and smartly. And guess what? Some people do it all safe and smart and still die in aviation. And that's part of it. That's the risk we all take. Is this a good time to bring up? Is this a good time to bring up? I was almost run over by one of your tugs. No, there's <laughs> never a good time to bring that up. <laughs> but, but I'm going to have to hear the story sometime. <laughs> Get the violin out. Uh, it was an operator error. Don't worry. Okay, well, good. I was, I was like, we haven't had any stories of tugs running away on their own, but we have had the operators do silly things. Hey, I want to say no, one thing on that subject, oh. Steve. Because I have run into this quite a bit where people are, um, you know, oh, you're pushing the limits or you're doing this and it's dangerous. But what kind of boggles my mind are the people that make those comments. They have no problem going to an air show and watching the guy cut the ribbon inverted 10 feet off the ground. I mean, I mean, my stepdad flew uh, for the Thunderbirds. He was just, he taught me how to fly. He flew 
uh, solo pilot for the Thunderbirds. And, you know, and he's like, Jason, I didn't just show up at Nellis and jump in an F-16 and, and fly two feet off this guy's wing or fly inverted. I mean, you know, it, we stepped up to it over a number of months. And um, I just have never understood why those people that are judgmental on that we might be pushing the limits of our airplane and our skill set, that they just, they, they have no problem with the air show guys, you know, and I don't understand what's that difference. Is it just because we're not at the air show? I, like, I, I don't get it. Well, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. So down here at, at the Bentonville airport, uh, Sean Tucker has been down here for the better part of six months with his new formation aerobatics team in the game birds. They go out multiple times a day and fly. I mean, they're just every day. It doesn't matter what the wind is, what the weather is almost. They're always going out and flying these things. And when he talked the other day to us, we had a little group that he spoke to. It is amazing the preparation they go through. You just wouldn't even, nobody would think that it would, I wouldn't have thought it took that amount of preparation to do the stuff that they're doing. And it's really pretty fascinating. It involves a pretty significant commitment to, to safety and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the way you guys are doing that. So, and you know, and you're right though, we just see a little bit of video. So, so one of these days, let's make a really long, like a 24 hour video. Of like, uh, <laughs> one month of, watch. <laughs> exactly. Hey, speaking, speaking of uh, projects, uh, you guys have been built, you couple, you know, we always hear about your brother's darn airplane. What are you and what are you and Jason building? Can you talk about uh, that? He's, that? His is old news. <laughs> <laughs> Well, J uh, Jason and I uh, kind of went a different direction. You know, there was an intro video when Mike introduced his desire to build Scrappy, and Mike's goal with Scrappy was just big, badass bush plane. I mean, if you said, what's Scrappy? Just big, badass. If, it, if it's badass and adds weight, it's worth it. For Jason and I, we're kind of the opposite. If we can pull a gram out of it, we'll do it. And so, um, so Mike kind of went for how big, how cool, how fun, how loaded, how equipped, how outrageous of a plane can I build and and that's scrappy and it's awesome I mean it's like you stand next to it the thing is huge everyone that walks into the hangar and sees it the first comment is wow it's way bigger than I thought and it's because <laughs> it had to be all re-engineered completely for that engine it's big um Jason and I it's ambush and deception ambush is mine Jason's is deception the words are synonyms um the idea is a cub that looks like a cub they're six cylinder carbon cubs the engines had to be pulled back almost 20 the firewalls pulled back 20 inches you can't just put a six cylinder engine on a cub a lot of people have done that for banner towing but then you have to fly from the back seat now you get so much weight forward and so much weight behind you that once you yaw or get a yawing moment you get a ton of mass in motion that far away from the pivot point it's hard to stop it so it becomes an unwieldy airplane might not be fun and light on the controls to fly and it's gonna be slow to react. And we've loved our carbon cups because they're super light. So we wanted to take that engine, instead of putting the engine out front and, and wait in the back to offset it, we said, pull it real tight, real into the middle so it can feel light. And then just about everything we can do in titanium is titanium. Every aluminum part that could be rebuilt out of carbon fiber was rebuilt out of carbon fiber. And our goal is to be around 1,250 pounds and the engines are 330 horsepower like coming <laughs> thunderbolts built just for these planes. Wow. So our horsepower to weight ratio, we hope is uh, up there with Scrappy. It might even be a little bit uh, higher horsepower to weight ratio. So we have this in our dream. I will never bet against Mike, but Jason <laughs> and I, when we find another like seven ounces that we didn't figure out before we got we just pulled another seven ounces out of our plane we're like wouldn't it be great if scrappy's taken off vertical and we can pass him so that's, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know if it'll ever happen but they are built to be as light weight as they can be and in fact we came up with a formula uh to try to keep to figure out what we'll spend money on to keep weight and what we won't and and uh maybe jason you can kind of talk about that you know the the 200 horsepower per pound that was done in uh, Cub Crafters, which is what made them so light and then what we're doing on our planes to kind of determine where we spend money. Yeah. Well, we say we're paying like 500 a pound or whatever the number is, but to be honest, we haven't been paying attention to that. We just, any, anytime we can save weight, we save weight. And if it's in the, if it's in the front of the airplane, I mean, it just doesn't really matter what it costs. Um, I mean, we think we've got the CG figured out, but, but yeah, I kind of feel um, sometimes I feel like the, the, 
the insane person that realizes that he's insane because uh I mean, if Mark and I literally, if we can, if we find a way or we make some carbon fiber panels and we save a quarter of a pound, I mean, we are literally jumping up and down and <laughs> dancing and giving each other high fives. And then after I do it all, I, I, I kind of just go, man, we have really lost it. You know, we, we are, people must really think we're weird, but you know, really what it is, is we, um, we just, we are making every decision we can make to be lightweight, except for the engine. And, um, you know, and we're, we got a heavy engine and we're trying to just shed weight from everything we can. And we've even made some interior. Um, so Cupcrafters has some, some bent, just aluminum panels for the baggage compartment, which are super light. And um, I forgot the exact amount we saved. I mean, it was probably two pounds, but we spent, you know, a full day making carbon fiber panels to save two pounds and, and probably 500 bucks, you know, and, um, but it's, that's how you end up with light airplanes. It's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it, it. A, I'm not sure what puts a bigger smile on our face, you know, whenever we lose weight and, or, you know, cutting stuff out of our cage that we don't use and, and dropping it on the floor. It's like, we're like little school girls laughing. So. Yeah, that's, that's the big test from Burt Rutan, right? It was the, the if, if there's something in your airplane, you take it out and you let go, but if it hits the ground, it was too heavy. So that's <laughs> us. If we, we pull something out of the plane, it might only might only be 10 grams, but every time I let go of it, it has hit the floor. So we, <laughs> we celebrate. So they're still going to be heavy because the engines are heavy, but the Cubs, if they weren't for these big engines, they would be shockingly light. I mean, we really, there's almost every piece of hardware in there that can be done in titanium has been done in titanium. It's, but I hope they fly good. <laughs> Who knows? We might, we might get it all done and say that was a waste of time and money, but we're sure enjoying the journey. But so when are you going to know that? When's the, when's the liftoff date? Oh, we're just finally getting done building the kit. Are you kidding? It's like Chandra, <laughs> Mike's wife, Chandra's building an FX3. And she just got her kit and she's starting. And we're finally to the point where we pulled the engines back off the front of our plane so we can send the frames off to get sandblasted and powder coated. So after all this time making just, I mean, dozens and dozens of parts and, and I mean, uh, uh, countless hours, we haven't been counting them. We're finally to the point where when the frames come back from powder coat, which would be next week, we get to start building our airplane. It's like we're finally to the point that Chandra is pulling it out of a box. And so, but we, we hope that, uh, we hope that, you know, in six to eight months, they'll be throttled up and pointed north. So I think it'll be pretty neat if Chandra all of a sudden be, completes her kit before everybody else. That'd shut your mouth. You just, you just <laughs> shut your <Yeah>. mouth. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but it would be neat yesterday i was she was asking me what she should do and i said um i said you should just so on a carbon cub the whole floorboard and seat base is is one carbon part and you build that whole part up uh on sawhorses so you install your torque tubes install your brake pedals and, and everything's done outside of the airplane and when that part's finished you put it in the airplane and screw it down and you're done and so i told chandra i said you should start working on your uh on your seat base and your floor pan pan you know, and when you're all done, you can put it in your airplane and bolt it down and you're done with it. And she and she goes, wow, I, I see like Mike's always putting stuff in his plane and taking it out. I said, yeah, my my floor plan has been or my um, seat pan and floor base has been in and out of my airplane at least 500 times right now. You know, <laughs> you, yours is going to go in one time and get screwed down. So there's a big difference between building a kit by a manual and and the Cub Crafters kit is so good and the manuals are great. Um and, and we're just, you know, we're out here re-engineering and figuring out it out on our own. We have no manual we can go look at to do stuff. So it's it's amazing how much uh, more work it is to to try to shoehorn a big engine in a carbon cup than you would think. <laughs> yeah, and, and, to, and to try to get it right. You know, it's, yeah. it's easy to throw weight in the tail and make it work, but we want airplanes that we enjoy flying. So yeah, as far gotta, as we I know, gotta, nobody's done it. As, you know, as far as we know, nobody's really brought an engine back and had the CG right. Every uh, Cub, and I know several Cubs that have 540s, but they were just 540s bolted on the engine mount. Yeah, or pulled back three inches, you know, because that's all they could do. But, I mean, ours came back 20. It's a lot. The seat 
pilot seat came back 10, but we still have back seat. I have to throw a plug out there for Mike's wife, Chandra. She's in there building that cub and um, Mike's, Mike's a great man and a great husband, but he's not helping her. He is so focused <laughs> on Scrappy. Mike is like a dog with a bone. I mean, when he gets a project in his mind, you cannot pull that project out of his teeth. And so here's Chandra in the build center in the background as Mike's just going like a Tasmanian devil building Scrappy. And Chandra's over there with her manual. She's got her tools. She's, you know, reading the instructions. She's got a little torque wrench and she's just putting so much effort into it. I'm like, when she gets that plane done, that will be a Chandra Patey built start to finish on her own. She is, she's a trooper. And I just, I hope other women and even, even men, any pilot that will look at her and go, you know what? She didn't go pay someone to do it. She didn't go get help. She didn't have all this experience. Chandra got a kit and she just is building it. And it's, it's awesome. That it's fun awesome. to watch. That is awesome. Kevin, you, know you got anything like, else to say? I, what I love about these Zoom meetings is I've gone and I've looked and shared my screen and I see Lou Furlong sitting on the beach. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> I see Gary Ward down here eating peanuts and drinking beer. John Young, of course, was representing Arkansas. And I see Chip and I see all these faces. Doug Turnbull, I need you to make me a rifle. And I, I see these faces that are just, you know, you see them on the internet and it's, this is awesome. We should do this once a week. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Well, we should sure appreciate you guys doing it. We, we do yeah. actually on Sunday nights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're ever bored on a Sunday night, you can always come to the, to the chat we have, the supercrime.org chat we have. So uh, cool. <laughs> it's neat. And this, this becomes hangar flying. I mean, because where I am here in Truckee, We've got all these folks that are at the airport, but there's no hangar doors open ever. And our, our poor little EAA chapter, oh, I would love to do anything we can to resurrect that. That's part of this whole Stearman thing is trying to bring aviation and youth back because of this distance learning and all that stuff. But this is awesome, the hangar chat that goes on here. And, and so I need to participate more on Sunday night. This is pretty awesome. Well, guys, any parting words? You do, this has really been awesome to have you here. And, and thanks for taking the, making the time for us. Well, thanks for having us. It was fun. Thank you, Steve, Laura. And we look yeah. forward to, I'm just already imagining this video of Chandra and a whole chat. Yeah, you guys have got to be working on something there that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> we sure appreciate you. I, I, the only parting words I'd have is get out and fly, guys. Assume the best in everybody around you and uh, you'll live a happier life. Just get out in your airplanes and enjoy it. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for you guys. This will be on YouTube. If your friends missed it, they can uh, they can watch it from the same YouTube link later. And uh, next week, actually, we have a pretty interesting guy, DJ Knott, who is a uh, Bolivian, I believe it is, a missionary. And he's going to talk about learning to fly a Super Cub at 10,000 feet in, uh, in that part of the world. It should be pretty cool. So uh, that's what's happening next week. We'll see everybody then. Thanks, Kevin, Jason, and Mark. Appreciate you being here.